story of Milne Bay. Uh, last weekend, there were eight veterans went to Milne Bay. They were accompanied by family, friends, members of the Australian military force, and locals. And uh, they were greeted, and uh, quite a memorable occasion. The Battle of Milne Bay took place 70 years ago. In fact, <coughs> on this day, the Japanese started their retreat. And you'll see uh, that as we go through the, the slides. <coughs> That's the memorial at Milne Bay. It's double that height, and so if there's someone standing in front of it, their hat would just be in the bottom of it. It's rather a large and grandiose range. The significance of the Battle of Milne Bay is that it secured Australia from the threat of invasion and the battle is considered to be the first in the Pacific campaign in which the Allies uh, decisively defeated the Japanese forces. Some people say that is of equal importance to the effort at Kokoda and this was mentioned last week in the news when people were commentating on what was happening uh, at the ceremony at uh, Milne Bay. The Allied forces hadn't had much success up until this stage and in the eight months from Pearl Harbor up until this time uh, the Japanese had moved almost at will through the uh, islands coming south. That struck troubles at Kokoda, the Kokoda track across the Owen Stanley Ranges there. <coughs> They decided that they would outflank uh, the forces, the Australian forces, and move into Milne Bay, and they conducted a landing in the bay. They did it without a lot of reconnaissance and research, and it was probably ill-founded that they moved so quickly. Port Moresby was what the Japanese wanted, and Port Moresby was what the Americans, General MacArthur, <coughs> was very interested in protecting. The Australian effort at Kokoda and uh, what followed at Milne Bay was to keep uh, the Japanese out of Port Moresby. So Milne Bay, on the very end of uh, Papua New Guinea, but it was the territory of Papua in those days, but it is now PNG, the whole lot of it, and so the Japanese landed where the red line is there, the Allied base is where the yellow uh, section is, and they moved along the North Shore there, towards the Allies. This is what they were after. <coughs> there were two airstrips in Milne Bay and a third one under construction. The Americans were working on a third one about two miles behind you. This and most other photos are taken looking down the bay. So this is looking roughly east. Uh, east, south east, but roughly east. Um, strip number three was the active one, that one up there. And this one was uh, the secondary strip. And of course, um, the, uh, the one behind you by a couple of miles uh, was going to be in case these fell. That's a nice painting that I came across once again. It's uh, P-40s, Kitty Hawks, flying up the bay, and behind that you can see the bay. Uh, the bay is about 20 miles long and about 10 miles wide. And so the Japanese forces landed in this region here. The area was not well mapped, and they made an error. They intended to land further in. Uh, but it didn't happen. Uh, it was very misty and rainy um, and foggy when they did land and they, they got it wrong. And so on the night of August the 25th and 6th, that's where the Japanese landed. On the 27th, they moved about a mile uh, to the west with stiff opposition from the Australian forces. The Australian forces were made up of virtual rookies who had not been engaged in warfare before, <coughs> but they were backed up by uh, a group of Australians who had just been withdrawn from the Middle East. And so they'd come from desert 
warfare to jungle warfare, and uh, it was a huge change. However, they were experienced, and uh, that showed. The next day, after uh, spirited fighting, they moved uh, right up to the airstrip number three. And this was pretty exciting for everyone involved. The 29th was a re uh, relatively quiet day. But the 30th saw spirited warfare taking place. And by the 31st, the Japanese accepted the fact that their logistics system their supplies were running out and they had to withdraw. And so, uh, this day, that dotted line took place 70 years ago. You got the numbers of troops in the whole time? Uh, three and a half thousand Japanese. More than that, the Australians had prior warning and uh, they bolstered their supply of troops. And so there was a sizable number in excess of that. The Japanese called for reinforcements to build their numbers up. Um, but they had problems as well because by this time uh, the Royal Australian Air Force was uh, taking pot shots at their barges, landing equipment. This photo is once again looking down the bay, looking down strip number three. So we're looking down here and down the bay. So there's strip number three and this was that last <coughs> graphic that you saw where the Japs came around the bend on the uh, 28th, was it? Yeah. 28th. Spirit of fighting uh, on the 30th and then they withdrew. That was the divider between the two. Uh, opposing forces were looking at each other and I've read that not one Jap crossed over that strip. And so back they went. <coughs> And so that started a withdrawal. It took place over a week, once again, spirited fighting as the Australians. And uh, the Americans had uh, construction engineers uh, in the area making the strips, and uh, they lent a hand as well. Uh, they, they gave away their construction effort and uh, came to the front to assist. That gives you a bit of an idea of what uh, they were confronted with. The average rainfall is 200 millimetres and they got more than their average over this week. And so little streams turned into torrents and uh, made the whole show almost impenetrable. Aircraft uh, taxiing and taking off on mud strips, they were using the whole of the strip and uh, risking life and limb to get airborne. Uh, kunai grass, is it? Um, and uh, these are Japanese light tanks that got uh, attacked. There's a, a blitz buggy from the Australian troops. Uh, heartbreaking to see it uh, like that. Don't know, it could be a, a liberator, but I don't think it was. Uh, it is. I don't think that would be during the Milton Bay campaign. It could have been before or after, but certainly it looks like it was dry when that photo was taken. This is an aerial photograph of the coastline of New Guinea. Uh, the Allies, the Australians, had an aircraft flying at 200 feet around the entire island and taking uh, oblique photographs of the shoreline. And you can see a note there, which is a hut and a reference number. And uh, this would be annotated and people would uh, know if they can contact that file or have a look at that file as to what the hut was all about. There were lots of settlements around the coastal palm plantations. Command headquarters, <laughs> not a very substantial arrangement. Japanese barges, anti-aircraft installation, Kitty Hawk approaching to land. Steel mesh was used uh, to uh, taxi the aircraft to service areas or revetments. Group of pilots, their names underneath. Put him in the truss cot up there getting out of the aircraft. He went on to make a name for himself and then got crucified by the, the RAF. <coughs> Japanese barge, the recreation centre where the Australian troops went for a bit of enjoyment. And they're the victors. In a Japanese barge, 
with the Japanese flag. There was one Victoria Cross, and this John Alexander French took off with a couple of hand grenades and wiped out a machine gun post, went back to his unit, got some more hand grenades, went forward and wiped out another uh, machine gun post, went back, got ammunition, and went back uh, out in the fray for a third time. So that's it. A lot of people don't know much about it. Um, I hope you all have a pretty good understanding of it now. Thanks.